is on history and science, public health, and the environment. So I would like to, we have three really very interesting and uh, uh, panelists this morning who are, I think, kind of showing us the way of the future in terms of how to combine a PhD in history with other activities and activism. <laughs> So our first speaker is Merlin Chaukonwan, excuse me, Chaukonwan, Young, sorry, um, University of Wisconsin-Madison. He is um, interested in the history of public health and health policy, racial inequality, and social movements. In his dissertation, he looked at the development of post-World War II medical care and environmental health hazards in, in four different regions in the U.S. Now he's working on another book about political unrest at medical schools and neighborhood health activism during the 60s and 70s. He's writing a series of articles that question dominant theoretical assumptions and frames in what's in quotes, racial disparities research. He's had a long-standing interest also in digital media, in using digital media to disseminate findings and data sources. He serves on a committee that digitized a 30 plus year run of the Health um, a PAC Bulletin, a policy publication. And in this work, he sought to fuse health activism with rigorous policy analysis. So we are very, very lucky to have him um, here today, but also to have him coming to uh, Columbia to be um, to take up a position as an assistant professor of sociomedical sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health and a member of the Center for the History and Ethics of Public Health. He's coming um, in fall 2015. So without further ado, I will hand over the podium to Merlin. Thank you for that and thank you uh, to the conference organizers. Uh, yesterday I had a series of delays uh, because of a LaGuardia skinny incident. So, uh, they really helped uh, mm -hmm. going on hold with Delta for three hours and switching things around, so thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to be attending this conference to discuss public health policy and what history can bring to it. And so I want to start first with some just general remarks and then move to a specific application of historical methods in a non-historical domain. So let me start first, uh, let me start with first some general remarks. Uh, I am a historian of public health and I was attracted to that field because it seemed to allow one to connect with people in real world public health practice all while doing history. But as with many things in graduate school, I quickly became quite sober. I was able to, <laughs> I was able to get a master's in public health at the same time and it took me to a lot of different quarters of campus and it's how I first noticed what I call the seat at the table problem. And the seat at the table problem basically boils down to this. As a discipline, I'm not sure historians have as aggressively asserted their importance and been as su successful in weaving their way into non-history circles, public health or otherwise, as they might. So in my case, uh, I was at health policy centers on campus, hanging out at wor workshops on Medicare reimbursement, reading a lot of Institute of Medicine and Health Foundation reports. And I noticed that, as I say, historians were mostly absent. If you look at the neighboring social sciences, sociology, <coughs> political science, and especially economics, they have much more success at injecting their perspective into major public health debates, for better or for worse. In the run-up to the Affordable Care Act, for example, in the current debate over its potential repeal, you see this play out. Historians, again, very absent in that debate. They do not have a seat at the table, and so I continue to wonder why that is. Well, because everything in academia seems to occur in triads, I want to focus on three interrelated <laughs> barriers. And they are as follows. One, language and rhetoric, how we talk to other people in the academy. Methodology, how we do and don't do our research. And last, disposition, how we kind of view others. So let me start with the first, language and rhetoric. Now fortunately, I think history is in a good position in that most of the writing is really not larded with gratuitous jargon like some of those other disciplines I mentioned earlier, so that's a, a good first step. But I also think historians seem to cling on to discipline-specific ways of framing things. 
But unfortunately, I found that, at least in public health, I found that approaching things out of the gate in a historical perspective, where the word history is very foregrounded, sometimes turns a lot of people off, rightly or wrongly. A lot of people, when they hear history, immediately think it's just background music. Others are prepared for a pedantic lesson that doesn't seem to really address a particular problem at hand. That's especially true for frontline practitioners. In the last panel, we heard about the time problem, so you know they, they have a real cut, cut to the chase mentality. So you have to find a way of weaving history in a more subtle and stealth mode. On one level for me, that just meant using some of the very wording that is common in public health circles. So I found that instead of saying archival sources or primary sources, the word data just seemed to calm a lot of people down. <laughs> <laughs> Chronological, temporal, longitudinal instead of historical. I mean, some of these sound incredibly silly and superficial, but they do make people more comfortable talking to historians. Phraseology really counts. And more substantively, you have to remember that people in these circles aren't quite as steeped in multiple layers of historiographic debate, theoretical debate, that we are. So how we talk about history to each other, in other words, is not going to be the same as we need to talk about it with them. I had an experience recently where this became a challenge. So I served for a semester as a consultant to the Institute of Medicine's Roundtable on Population Health. This is a group, as you might expect, of very rarefied types, a few academics, foundation executives, uh, health systems executives, a couple of public officials in uh, county public health departments. And to their credit, this group was very concerned that the group was too insular. It, was, it wasn't really engaging with uh, some of the social movements around health that exists. So these, pe these are people who regularly meet in Newport Beach and Washington, D.C. Uh, boardrooms. This is that kind of crowd. So the problem was, they weren't really very familiar with these movements or any of the literature on these movements. And so I was asked if I could write a brief distilling what they needed to know. Now, if I did it in a style of a historical review essay or a historiography paper, dear God, it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> I mean, I'm interested and historians are interested in the different ways of school, different ways of schools of thinking about this, uh, current fractures within how we talk about social movements, et cetera, but these are too scholastic for a practitioner audience. So I actually had to start with a completely different square one, their problem. How do we make this elite circle more responsive to what real people are actually doing around population health issues? And I came up with a brief that elaborated on persistent dilemmas that have arisen when it comes to social movements and policy making at the top. Uh, building and maintaining coalitions, negotiating the respective roles between establishment elites and those outside, how explicit and specified legislative goals should be in movements, etc. And the, example I, uh, the examples I used mostly came from history, but it was written in a style designed for people outside of our discipline. Getting better at the language issue only occurs, just like learning a foreign language, with a lot of immersion and practice. But even now, working in a medical school, I rarely see anybody from the humanities come over to interact with people there. Without that kind of interaction, the language barrier will only continue. This brings me to the second barrier I discussed, methodology, method. Those other three disciplines I mentioned earlier all share one thing in common. Quantitative and computer-assisted methods are very much a core part of those disciplines and everybody's training whether you're an ethnographer or a regression analysis, you have to learn these methods. But that's not the case in history, and I worry it's a real problem. It means we basically extricate ourselves from important conversations where quantitative data and metrics are front and center. In public health and epidemiology, where quantitative and digital methods are dominant, not just in academia, but outside of it, this is a real barrier. And to the extent we do engage with these approaches, historians tend to be hypercritical and suspicious. So we can all in this room, I'm sure, go to town highlighting all this rampant reductionism in economic modeling, spurious correlations between variables with no institutional context to explain them, and on and on. I get that totally. I've made that critique myself. But it's really not the best way to engage people who use those techniques on a day-to-day -day basis. And it discounts, and frankly, is disres disrespectful 
of the interpretive challenges that often accompany those approaches, even though they're different than the ones we face. The absence of quantitative analysis is, is especially lamentable these days when computing power is so abundant and cheap and the learning curve much less steep. So you used to have to take 20, 30 years ago manuscript census data to someone in a basement usually who would load it onto punch cards. And you'd have to sit and wait for three or four weeks to get your results. I mean, given that, I probably would have been a non-quantitative historian just to avoid the, the, the learning trips. But, you know, even if we don't produce that kind of work, I feel both in public health and other domains, we should at least be able to consume and engage with this kind of work much more actively than we do. So how do we remedy that? Well, my view is that there's not enough permanent structure to facilitate the kind of interaction I've talked about here with both methodology and with language. Right now, it feels like it's a real de facto laissez-faire, do-it-yourself, individual bootstrap approach. The message seems to be that if you want to learn how to think like someone in public health, or how to think like someone in urban planning, or what have you, go to SEPA, or go to the Mailman School of Public Health, or go to the Architecture and Planning School and try to pick it up informally. <coughs> or if you're really dedicated, go on your own, take a sequence of methods courses that historians don't typically take. I think that's great if you have that individual willpower, but for most, you need structures that actually push and mandate people, that actually push and mandate people, whether that's full-blown joint degree programs or inter-school joint training programs, there are many possibilities. History as a discipline strikes me as very behind the wheel on this. For all the admirably stirring talk about alternative careers and putting historians in spaces where they often aren't, a crucial step seems to be missing, training and skill acquisition. You don't learn how to talk to an epidemiologist or a health planner through infrequent casual osmosis. You do it through workshops, you do it through courses, you do it through events where you're immersed in their problems, their discourses, their ways of seeing things. And I'd like to see more discussion of how that can happen. That brings me to my last barrier, and I'll be brief here, and that's disposition, disposition, or how we relate and see the world around us as historians. Now, one dimension has already been discussed by others. This is the disciplinary disposition against presentism, concern that analysis might be compromised by collision with policy imperatives, activist imperatives, which I think makes us afraid to step outside of comfort zones. But I add another dimension to this position, and that's a jadedness, a jadedness that often comes through, especially when we study policies of the past. In my own field, reading a lot of this work, and I'll freely admit uh, some of my own, you sometimes get the impression that people in public health and public policy can do absolutely nothing right. But in the end, they're always prisoners of capitalist, imperialist, neoliberal, structural limits of the time. In many ways, that's a very, very helpful and useful corrective to bring to today's practitioners, who often drink too much Whiggish, triumphalist Kool-Aid about their lines of work. But by itself, just alone, it can also quickly lead to cynicism, and it can quickly alienate people that historians should be trying to work with. Actually spending time with practitioners in the ways I described above can help cultivate a much more empathetic sense of the barriers they face while improving one's historical analysis and making it more useful to people working in public health or other social service fields. So to wrap up, Tanya asked if I could talk about a new project uh, that I'm working on with David Rosner, a professor of history and public health here at Columbia, Jerry Markowitz, a historian at CUNY, and the Center for Public Integrity, which is an investigative journalism organization in Washington, D.C. that focuses on the influence of money in politics and environmental health issues. Uh, they won their first Pulitzer Prize last year, so we're very honored uh, to be partnering with them. And together with them, we are building what will be the world's largest database of full-text searchable documents about industrial poisons. So benzene, asbestos, lead, polyvinyl chloride, PCBs, you name it, we have it. And then we're automatically sorting millions of these once secret documents that emerge from secret corporate archives. This is part of a larger trend in tort litigation after the 1990s tobacco lawsuits where a number of similar suits and a number of similar suits now are being filed by plaintiffs um, for other toxic substances like the ones I just named. And for historians, the cases have yielded a giant stockpile of documents. 
these cases hinge on historical questions. How much did industrial firms know about the hazards of their products and when? What was the state of toxicological science at specific points of time? How much did firms disclose or not disclose to regulators? And beyond the legal tort issues themselves, these documents offer a window into larger issues facing the public health professions, including the role of firms in shaping public opinion about the safety of products and conflict of interest in medical research. So I'll just show you two of the documents here, and I'm going to have to move a little so oh, it stretches out. Great. I'll show you a couple of these. Uh, this is from a collection of documents related to PCBs. And this first one here is actually a pretty obscure paper about PCBs, unpublished, but that landed in Monsanto's archive. This is a Japanese public health scientist writing about PCB content in mass market papers. So this is the early 1970s or so. And wondering aloud why there isn't more oversight of this. So you can see it here, it's a little faint, but it's a little faint to me, but uh, he, he writes, it was proved thus that PCB in the paper easily sticks to fingers when we handle it. It also demonstrated that only one third of the PCB sticking to fingers can be removed by ordinary hand washing. And then down below, nevertheless, the free use of PCB for this kind of very popular copying paper necessarily leads to the uncontrollable heavy direct exposure of general population to it. In view of its chemical and pathological characteristics, we consider that the use of PCB for the paper should be discontinued. So there's all sorts of these kind of insider <coughs> documents that have never been seen before uh, that we're now uh, sorting and making available. This here, this next one, is from the Lead Industries Association. This is a trade group. Uh, and they're distributing a tip sheet to lead executives telling them how to handle the media. So this next, uh, this next image, this is something they call the ammo technique. The ammo technique. So this is telling people how to respond to concern that natural lands in national parks and that kind of thing, uh, particularly around lead mines, um, contain lead poisoning. And it gives a key message, as you can see highlighted, vacationers should not be alarmed Abandoned lead mines pose no health hazard. Lead is an essential element in everyday life. <laughs> and then a conclusion, very pithy, the public lands are safe. You know, with the amount of money they have, you sometimes are surprised that this is the best they can come up with. <laughs> One of the issues with all of these documents, though, is that they basically come to us in an absurdly crude, unsorted way, like basically just giant data dumps where you can have everything from uh, an executive's airline ticket to something more substantive like this to boardroom minutes to newspaper clippings. It's just a huge mess. And the text on a lot of them wasn't even machine readable. That is, the letters looked like images to the computer, so you wouldn't be able to search or copy paste and do things you would want to do. So we had to figure out a way to process them. And because there's millions of documents, my laptop basically fried after like document 3000. So we've been working with the Open Science Grid. Uh, this is a consortium of <coughs> universities, including Columbia and most uh, major R1 institutions, and they pool together all their computing power nationally. This was actually used in the higgs boson uh, calculation. So, um, and you can do processing of documents much more quickly than you can on a little machine, as I say. We're also working with data scientists to provide some tools that will allow everyone from attorneys to environmental activists to historians to comb through these in a meaningful way. You'll be able to filter documents by geographic region. You'll be able to see phrases that appear frequently and in proximity to certain words. You'll be able to able to extract names of key figures, people that would be very hard to find if you had to, Lord mercy, read through this one by one by hand. So uh, we have a preliminary version of the site up right now with a very simple full text search, but increasingly robust versions are going to be appearing in a series of releases uh, throughout this and next year. Uh, right now it contains a bunch of benzene documents uh, only, but here's a document on the oil industry global strategy to handle new benzene limits that are now being set around the world. There's many more like this. So this project is driven by historians, but we're working with attorneys, journalists, and data scientists. And that means taking into account, as I said earlier, both methodology and language. We familiarized ourselves with the infrastructural requirements of a project like this, but we also present it in a way where the historical element is much more implicit than explicit. 
I mean, we could easily frame this as you know, text mining environmental history or digital history, digital environmental history, but I think that actually lessens the appeal to the non-historical audiences we're trying to reach, especially people who are just, for whatever reason, scared of the H word, history. So we kind of bury it. And in the end, I think signaling broadly, rhetorically signaling broadly, not narrowly, and hanging out with people who aren't just historians uh, is the real entry path to a world outside of history departments. Thank you. Two answers to that. One is an answer I don't like giving because I don't like this, you know, you got to kind of do it on your own and be this interdisciplinary person all by yourself type discourse. But I think for now, in the absence of the structures I was advocating, the training structures I was advocating, the absence of that in a widespread, comprehensive way, that's all you can do. So it means actually showing up, going across, most medical campuses, public health campuses, uh, tend to be located across the street or even <laughs> farther, you know, across town, like the case of Boston, uptown here. So actually going there physically actually opens a lot of doors. I mean, I'm 
honestly, we have a lot of very interesting talks at our med school that are very, I think, uh, of value to, to people who study politics. Uh, they're not so many, many historical talks, but they're talks where you think other people besides med students and, and physicians uh, you know, would, would be interested in, and no one ever comes there. It's just like a five minute bus ride in, in, in Madison. So I think just showing up really counts. And reading the journals that they publish in, you can kind of get a sense of, uh, of, of how they think and how they frame problems, often the same problems we're working on, but just in different ways. So I think just immersion. But like I said, you know, I, I don't like saying that, I don't like giving that as the answer because it puts all the onus on the student himself or herself. I mean, I remember my first three years of graduate school, it was just kind of bumbling and trying to find my way through. So on top of that, having to figure out how to design a, a program where I can you know, learn history well, but also get into these other orbits, seems to me a lot to put on one individual person. So you really need kind of structures that, that uh, allow this to be facilitated where, where the student himself or herself isn't doing all the work. I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, and I think that it's interesting. Um, you know, I think you're absolutely right that you have to try and get a seat at the table, but once you have a seat at the table, I would like to, um, you know, have articulated by this conference, actually, a set of, you know, um, uh, bullet points of why history is a powerful methodology in itself and why it is, in fact, you know, that looking at things from a historical perspective can actually um, bring, not, you know, you can put it in those terms, but can bring to the table something really, really valuable. So, um, yes, David, real quick. I, you know, I absolutely agree. Uh, if you look at this month's issue of Milbank Quarterly, one of the prestigious journals in public health policy. Uh, if you look at the American Journal of Public Health, what you will find are two art three out articles on history. You're going to find in the HAPH a regular column. When you go to their conferences, you will see that one of the best attended sessions at the American Public Health Association, a meeting of 18,000 people, are the history sessions. They are dying for it. But we probably in this room, or at least a historian, historical profession, probably doesn't even know they're happening. Yeah. And it's a bizarre kind of juxtaposition, I think, that we're facing as we try to put in place this interdisciplinary program. The fact that the worlds are so isolated from one another. And, and that's another thing. I mean, going to their space is really important. And I really believe this thing about trading zones. I mean, that you go to the, and hang out. I'm hanging out now in chemistry building. I mean, in a chemistry lab, and you just learn things, actually by osmosis, but also <laughs> by <laughs> talking to people. So thank you so much. This was just a terrific start. So I'm very, very pleased to um, introduce our second speaker, Dr. Elise Lipkowitz. Um, and she, I've known Elise for a long time since she was the graduate student representative on the AHA Council, so it's wonderful to have her here. Um, and she has taken a very interesting um, a journey in her uh, after her PhD. So she trained in as a historian of science and early modern Europe at, in history at Northwestern, and then went off to do a postdoc and became an assistant professor. Um, and then she decided to take this um, this uh, AAAS science and technology policy fellow in the National Science Board office position. So that's a, that's a mouthful, and um, as a member of the board, uh, she's on uh, the board office's policy team, so she's actually on a policy team. She works on a variety of foundation-wide initiatives, including communicating the value of NSF's investments in fundamental research. She tries to educate Congress people about that. Um, she also <laughs> educates the public about it. Um, she helps chart the future of NSF's large facilities portfolio, which includes ships and telescopes <laughs> and satellites, presumably, too, right? Um, and she prepares policy papers on the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics workforce and the application of the NSF's broader impacts criterion. So she wanted me to say that she was attracted to this AAAS fellowship 
by the opportunity to really experience firsthand in the present two themes that were at the center of her scholarship as a PhD student. That is the interrelationship of science and government and the history of nationalism and internationalism in science. So I think it's, you know, I, I say, I, I introduce you with such great pleasure because I really think you are doing the history that, you know, began, you're, you're in the history of science, I mean, you're doing the history of science in the present day that really began in the, um, in the early modern period, and especially in the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars that you are also publishing a book with Chicago University Press um, about. So um, please help me welcome Felicia. Good afternoon. It's actually 1201. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Professor Smith for that generous introduction, and Professor Costo, and, and Tanya, and all the other grad student organizers uh, for this event. Um, it's my pleasure to be here today. I'm going to talk about my perspective on history in action, which, as Professor Smith mentioned, stems from my current experience. It's been about 18 months that I've been an American Association for the Advancement of Science, Science and Technology Policy Fellow. I just want to say a little bit about this fellowship. Um, each year, AAAS, which is the largest scientific society in the world, brings nearly 275 social science and science PhDs to Washington for a one or two year policy experience in either the legislative or executive branch. There have been other historians of science in the past, but I must say uh, I am vastly outnumbered by the natural scientists and engineers. Um, and uh, I think you'll hear in my conversation of my today that my, my take is, is largely shaped by how I as a historian interact uh, at an agency where, uh, to my knowledge, I'm the only one in the building uh, mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, as Professor Smith said, my fellowship has been with the National Science Board. This is the 25 member board of directors that works with the National Science Foundation's director to set policy for the foundation. The board also serves as an advisor of, to president, the president and to Congress on matters of science and engineering. It's one of a couple of entities across town uh, that has that role. So it's, uh, for me as a historian, it's been interesting to see how uh, these various entities uh, create a, a kind of ecosystem. As a fellow, I've had the opportunity to interact with the National Science Board and other members of NSF's leadership, as well as with the congressional committees that have jurisdiction over the NSF and other federal science agencies. In the process, I've gotten to learn how this corner of the science policy world functions and lend my input, perspective, and expertise. Now, um, there are two disclaimers uh, before I, I continue. First, I'm not an employee of the National Science Board or of the National Science Foundation, and my comments do not necessarily reflect those of the NSF or the National Science Board or its personnel. And I'm going to talk uh, about the corner of the policy world that I've observed. As we heard in the last session, um, the policy world can be a very diverse place, and um, the world that I've been inhabiting of the NSF and the federal science policy ecosystem, it's a small segment of that world. And I think it's important um, to think that, about the fact that policymaking happens at all levels of government, state, local, and federal, and in associated organizations, and that efforts to influence policy happen in even a broader array of settings. My work as a scholar and as a policy fellow entails inhabiting interrelated but largely distinct worlds. As a scholar, I write about science and state relations and scientific communities at a time when the relationship between science and the modern nation state and the modern international order were forming. My historical focus spans the time when scientific expertise came to be embraced by enlightenment governments as well as by the educated public. In my book project, which explores the eclipse of early, the early modern scientific republic of letters amid the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, I developed the idea that the outlines of the modern national and international organization of science emerged from transformations in science-state relations in France during the Revolutionary and the Napoleonic Wars. 
As a science policy fellow, I function within the American science policy ecosystem that acquired its modern structure after the Second World War. From my perch within NSF, I get to observe how the phenomena that interest me intellectually and that I trace in Europe in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, that is the relationship between science and state, between nationalism and internationalism and science, and public faith or lack thereof in scientific expertise, play out in the contemporary United States. So what's the benefit of straddling these two worlds? My scholarship and my historical training permit me to bring a long view, or a long perspective, if you will, to the science policy questions discussed in NSF. This means that I can often stand back um, and, you know, and, 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 and see connections and patterns that, that folks who are more focused on the sort of last 10 years, as we heard from the ambassador, um, might miss. Simultaneously, my engagement with the policy process is prompting me to ask different, different historical questions than I would have asked, because as what Berlin said, it's, you, you find yourself in a different conversation, a different set of assumptions, a different set of questions, and that in turn um, changes the kinds of questions that I, as a historian, want to ask about the Um, the organizers asked me to talk a little bit about how, as a science policy fellow, I bring my historical training to bear on my science policy work. And um, if you'll forgive me, I've spent the last year and a half a scientist, I'm going to get a bit quantitative about this. I would say it's about 20% uh, my content knowledge, and it's about 80% what I call the historian's skills and sensibilities. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each of these. So the content knowledge piece. Um, during my fellowship, I've drawn on my knowledge of the history and sociology of science to help formulate policy reports and congressional testimony that explain the process of scientific discovery, the innovation ecosystem, and this is particularly important for NSF, which has to explain how the kind of fundamental research that by definition at the time it's pursued doesn't have a known application, connects up with the uh, activities that other federal agencies uh, fund, often at a later stage in their development. And I also spend a lot of time telling the story of the benefits that have been derived from previous federal investments in fundamental scientific research. I also use my knowledge of early modern European and US history to think a lot about institutions, societies, and structures. And structures. Like Ambassador Campbell, I am constantly struck by the parallels um, and connections between the early modern world uh, of, of Europe, uh, which, in which was like one of my fields of training, and the contemporary world of Washington, D.C. Yes, it is a Renaissance court. Um, and yes, we have a political system that is very much the legacy of uh, a generation of Anglo-American thinkers in the century after the English Civil War, who were incredibly anxious about power and the concentration of it. And um, I think one of the things that I bring um, to the policy process as a historian is a real understanding of um, our government and uh, a system that is designed to have checks and balances and move very slowly. Um, and that's, those are important to understand if, if you're going to try to uh, affect the policy process. To a far greater extent, though, I use the historian's skills and sensibilities. And what do I mean by that? First, that my frameworks for thinking about policy questions and historical questions have a good deal of congruence. When I approach a policy issue, my initial questions are, what's the story that needs to be told about this policy issue? What are the policy options? And who or what is best uh, able to address these issues. For me, given my training, these are implicitly both historical and present questions. And I think through them with the same frameworks that I would use to structure my scholarship. That is, when I'm analyzing a policy issue, I think about the place of continuity and change. I think about the interplay of structure and contingency. And I think about agency. And all of those things help me sort out the story. Now, to Merlin's point, I would never say this in this way to my colleagues. Um, they would make me very puzzled. 
um, with the set of words I used, but um, these are the ways that I think, and those are, those are the things that were ingrained in me um, through my graduate training. And on a day-to-day -day basis, I am struck by the similarities in my job tasks. As a scholar and as a policy fellow, I gather data, I approach my subjects from multiple angles, and I think critically about sources. And I must say, it's even more important that source training in this, this fast-moving policy realm where most of my research is done online. And as we all know, there's all kinds of things on the internet. Um, and being able to sift through it and, and be able to think critically about how this was produced, for what audience, by whom, um, that's, that's really vital. In both roles, I try to tell the truest story I can despite an incomplete record, whether that's just an incomplete historical record or an incomplete contemporary record, and despite conflicting data. In both um, roles, I aim to clearly and persuasively tell compelling stories. Policy making is fundamentally storytelling. Um, as a, in both roles, I manage projects. In both roles, I educate. And in both roles, I rely on the fact that graduate school taught me how to think critically and to learn in a self-directed way. And this capacity to learn in a self-directed manner is essential whether I'm contemplating the topic of my next manuscript, whether I'm writing a lecture for an undergraduate survey course on a topic outside my field of training, or in the policy world where I need to learn to write about all kinds of topics and issues that I haven't formally studied. Now these parallels notwithstanding, I found some pretty salient differences between doing historical scholarship and policy work. And here are a few. First, I think it's important, especially in light of yesterday evening's wonderful discussion of history and activism, to talk a little bit about the place from which one engages, if you will, with, with policy or with contemporary issues, sort of shapes your realm of action. And I think it's important to stress that as a policy fellow, I work within an agency that speaks with one voice to the outside world. This doesn't mean that I don't have the opportunity to engage with policy issues that matter to me or that I get to speak my mind on things, but it does mean that those things have to happen through appropriate channels. So I'm often ghostwriting um, work for other, that other people who are in a position to say these things um, will say or I'm having conversations internally with folks in the foundation about these things, but I have to be very, I, I can't speak publicly in my own voice on these things. So you, you won't find my policy thoughts on my Facebook account, um, and if you find them in the Washington Post, something has gone terribly wrong. <laughs> um, as Marilla mentioned, I, at NSF, um, I work much more with numbers, and this is unsurprising, I work with and for scientists, and data for them tends to be quantitative. Um, I would say that I would encourage everyone to sort of get a basic comfort with numbers. No one's going to take a historian in the organization and make them their lead statistician. But um, I, one of the ways I feel I've, I've grown professionally in the last year and a half is that I've learned to fight my natural predisposition to read the qualitative description that's next to the graph. Yeah. Um, before I actually study the graph, and now that I actually occasionally have to generate the graph, that means I actually have to understand the graph first um, before I can write the prose around it. Um, as we've heard um, from others this morning, in policy writing, um, I find I need to be relentlessly focused on the big picture. Policy audiences want brief documents that hit the bottom line directly, and then they need to be jargon-free. I also, in my policy writing, tend not to have the same luxury of time um, to do my research, and I need to be willing to offer recommendations. Um, and I think we've sort of hinted on that this is well, one of those places where the historian's comfort zone, um, where you get pushed beyond your comfort zone. Right? We're very confident about talking about the past, um, we're kind of predisposed to not want to talk about the future. Um, the policy analysis work I do is highly collaborative. Um, and um, I've also come to appreciate that what constitutes expertise in the two set settings is very different. And um, you know, in the policy world, 
having a PhD is what often counts. Um, it's not that I have an expertise in X geography, in, in X time period, um, and people are generalists, and, and, and uh, you have to be confident that your skills that you've been trained in will allow you to learn these other areas and domains um, quickly um, and enough, you know, have enough knowledge to do the policy work. Before I wrap up, I want to share a few words about uh, the importance of historical thinking in the policy realm and how scholarly findings, including those that emerge out of historical research, do and can function in the science policy world. At least in the corner of the policy world that I've been exposed to, that is you know, the science policy world, historical thinking is rarely discussed explicitly. I wouldn't expect it to be. Uh, I'm surrounded by scientists who are much spend most of their time wringing their hands about why scientific facts uh, aren't used uh, more consistently in the in the policy process. And I do think there's some interesting parallels um, as I've been thinking about um, the uses of history and policy with with these questions about the uses of of science, um, scientific expertise. I'll talk more about that. But I, what I would say is that. Every policy report or memo, including those that are produced in the science policy world, in its explanation of a present day policy challenge, relies implicitly or explicitly on a historical narrative. Very often, these narratives are not built on rigorous historical claims, but on widely repeated popular claims many of which do not stand up to historical investigation. So let me toss out a few that you can hear these days in Washington. Inequality is greater now than at any time in human history. The speed of technological innovation is happening faster than ever. We live in a more dangerous world than ever before. As historians, claims like these rightly give us pause. The counterexamples and the qualifications to those statements come to mind. So why are claims like these trotted out in some policy circles? And here I want to stress that I mean some policy circles, since there are many policy analysts, including my colleagues at the National Science Board, who do very analytical and responsible policy writing. So I have two thoughts on this. The first is the cynical take. In policy, you want to compel people to act, and claiming that the roof is on fire is an effective way to get action. But I think more often than not, these claims result from a lack of familiarity with the historical record and a disconnect between the scholars who possess the knowledge that could help articulate a more historically grounded story or a more scientifically grounded story, and the policy analysts. And here I want to echo what Merlin said, that uh, I have been struck um, in my 18 months in Washington that uh, there are lots of social scientists working in policy in Washington. There are very few historians. Um, and I do think it goes um, to some of the things that, that Merlin said about disposition. Um, but um, there's a lot of opportunity for us to be in this conversation. We've already talked a little bit about what some of these barriers are, but I do want to stress that one of the real challenges in addressing this disconnect results in, rests rather in translating the findings of historical scholarship into actionable policy-related insights and getting this actionable knowledge in front of policy analysts and policy makers. I would add to the reasons um, for this challenge that have been discussed by others, the idea that the incentives to do the translational work generally aren't there for either academic scholars or for policy makers. For the scholar in academia, tenure and promotion criteria do not tend to reward translational work. Similarly, the policy analyst even if he or she knew where to find the relevant academic scholarship, is often working on such a tight deadline that there's no time to read and analyze the relevant scholarship and determine how it can be applied to his or her policy work. And my sense is ultimately it's going to 
take a little bit of budging on both sides um, to make to get us beyond this. I'm gonna stop now, but I just want to emphasize that my time in the Policy Fellowship has given me a greater appreciation for the need to infuse historical thinking and accurate historical narratives into policy, into media reports, and into public discourse more generally. As historians, we know that the stories that people tell about themselves and about their nations, about their past, and about their present have power for better or worse to shape the future. And these stories are embedded in every kind of policy um, discourse. So as you think about your own careers, I'd encourage you to think about how you can bring your historical expertise and training um, to engage um, in, these, in these public discussions and to address the challenges of our time. Thank you. because it was there, I learned how to really talk like a social scientist and a scientist. 
um, and engage with, with those folks. So I think any sets of opportunities that you can build in uh, for students in graduate school to be engaging with folks across disciplines um, is, is really critical. Um, and the other thing I would say, though, it's also been interesting to me because many of my um, fellow fellows are coming from the natural sciences. They've spent their last five, ten years in labs. Their challenge in the policy fellowship is showing that they can work in the independently and manage projects. My <laughs> challenge is showing the world that I can play well with other people. Nobody <laughs> doubts that a historian who's conceptualized and written a dissertation from start to finish very much more independently than anyone does um, scientific work in graduate school um, can do that. So interesting. Okay, we're going to move along now, but thank you so much for being here. Okay, our third speaker today is uh, Professor Rod Mather. He is a colonialist and British historian. He's also an underwater archaeologist, and he is um, maybe best known for his studies of shipwrecks around the world, including revolutionary warships, um, the USS Monitor off the coast of Virginia, shipwrecks in, um, in Bermuda, and a fleet of German World War I ships in the Atlantic canyons off Virginia. Um, but his, uh, he's here today because of our interest in this conference on applied history. And he has established an applied history lab on campus at um, the University of, I'm sorry, Rhode Island. Yes, that's a good place to study shipwrecks. Um, at the University of Rhode Island um, to provide students with, as it says, unique opportunities to work at the intersection of the arts, humanities, and sciences. And so we're very fortunate to have Rod Amanda with us to talk to us about this kind of, exactly this kind of collaborative work that both previous panelists have talked about. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. I am absolutely thrilled to be here and to be talking to you. And I am also cognizant that I have my own triad in my my two fellow panelists are very, very difficult acts to follow. I've got too many slides. I've got to all stand between you and your lunch. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, bear with me, uh, if you will. Um, so um, historians love paradoxes. We love the <laughs> paradox. We're not, never happier than when we find a paradox. But I, from my perspective at the University of Rhode Island and looking at Profession, we have something of an unwelcome paradox. We work in a discipline that has extraordinary explanatory power. Extraordinary explanatory power. Its relevance and its capacity to explain the world in which we live seems so clear to us from our work. Yet many historians and history departments are struggling. Competition for jobs is exceptionally high. The number of history majors is falling, certainly in my institution is, and I think across the country. And there's a general perception that there are few opportunities for students to study the discipline. Many universities are leaning towards more vocational training, and parents are listening to a new orthodoxy that tells them that only certain majors can leave the jobs. Meanwhile, state and university administrators, like the ones that I work for, have a triple conundrum. They want, they're being told to do more or less money, as public money that is, bring more external research money into the institutions and the engines of economic growth. So history, unfortunately, doesn't intersect with these discussions and these priorities intrinsically. Except that administrators know that if they can make us teach more, then they'll get more money. And if we put more um, people in seats there, that helps the balance of payments for them. So as a discipline, therefore, history has a value. Um, that is as important today as it's ever been, yet the future is so unsure. And so for this reason, this workshop is so important and so timely, and I'm delighted to be here. The moniker of this um, conference asks this question, where is history most needed? And I thought I'd provide an answer, not perhaps the best answer, but an answer for us to think about. History is most needed where change is happening the fastest. 
This was most needed where changes happen faster. So there's lots of different ways of thinking about that, and we've heard about some of them so far, certainly in the health area, the health sphere, certainly in the whole manner of things to do with international relations. Change is happening very, very rapidly. We are experts in continuity and change. That's what we talk about, that's what we deal with. And so we are central to these discussions about change and where change is happening fastest. For me, one of the places where change is happening fastest is in the coastal zone. The number of Americans that live within 50 kilometers of the ocean is somewhere around about 40 percent. 10 percent of the land, 20 percent of the people. The growth in that population is approaching 40 million over the last 30 years. The density of that population is four and a half times what it is in the rest of the country. And the growth in that population in terms of the number of people moving there is three times the rate of everywhere else. And these numbers are mirrored across the planet. And so what does that mean? That means a whole number of things about which I think we can contribute. The consequences of this is that there is enormous development in the coastal zone and enormous demand for energy. Overwhelming pressure on coastal environments, resources and communities, and this presents significant problems and difficulties for policymakers and for planners and for environmentalists in general. And all of this is magnified by issues to do with climate change, sea level rise, and ocean acidification. And so why in this debate, why in this problem is history needed? It is needed because it provides us a deeper understanding of the issues and provides examples of previously tried solutions. Examples of previously tried solutions. And helps us anticipate outcomes of particular policies and actions and provides the language of linkage, the language of linkage across constituent groups and stakeholders. Historical thinking and analysis provides improved decision making and better solutions. And as soon as we can persuade policymakers of all that, then we are going to be in business a little bit more. So our problems are not new, we all know that. When we study history, we all study history and we all see its relevance. We all do history in action, as Tom said at the beginning. Virtually all our problems have historical context and we all know that the record of our attempts to tackle these problems is written down in text, but also, and this is where my training as an archaeologist comes in, is imprinted in the landscape. And it's the combination of text and landscape that really is part of the impetus of my work. So let's take one of the big things that we all know about and talk about. Let's take the example of sea level rise. So the graph that we have here represents time on the bottom, and, uh, and sea level rise will de decrease in sea level over time. So on the bottom we have the present day on the right hand side, and 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 years ago, and then on this side we have meters of sea level rise. So 7,400 years ago, sea level was 10 meters lower than it is today, and then 8,200 years, 20 meters lower, 9,400 years, 30 meters, 10,000 years ago, 40 meters lower than it is today, and 10,500 years, 50 meters lower than it is today. So let's see if we can see what that looks like. This is sort of what it looks like. This is today. This is where I live. Rhode Island's at the top there. This is Block Island. This is something called Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is today, so let's go back. Let's go back 7,000 years, 8,000 years, 9,000 years, 10,000 years, 11,000 years ago. I live in a coastal community. I live along a few miles from the beach. 11,000 years ago, I would have had to walk 45 miles to get to the beach. And there were people living all in this area, Native American groups, and as sea level rose, they had to respond to rising sea level. Now we can look at that archeologically, it's a little bit more difficult to look at that to written sources, but we can look at that archaeologically. But there are other examples of human interactions with the environment that do blend both archaeology and more recent history. So one more example. This, these are shipwrecks, shipwrecks in that same area. And these shipwrecks have a story through the historical documents and through their disposition and their location and their spatial distribution and also the temporal distribution of human interactions with the environment. 
Turns out this distribution is not random. It is patterned, and when we use GIS techniques, we can start to see some of those patterns. In fact, we can even generate a probability surface, and that probability surface tells us something about the way that human beings have been interacting with these coastal areas and with this zone. And it surprisingly fits quite well with some of the distribution patterns that we see for submerged prehistoric sites in this same area of water. Human use of these areas has been, in some ways, consistent over time. So, so much for the spatial distribution. Let's think about the temporal distribution quickly. So, this is a graph that shows numbers of shipwrecks per decade over time, starting in the 1730s and going right up to 2010. <coughs> but to give, show you this graph, instead of these groups of decades, so if it was to show you this graph for South Carolina or Virginia, Virginia, you'd be able to see the world wars in the graph, if you like. You'd be able to see the First World War, certainly the Second World War, as fights in the graph. Let's see them so well here in this graph in the Northeast, and this graph is similar to the one from the Connecticut, from Maine, from Massachusetts, and so forth. You see this huge spike in shipwreck losses in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and then the 1900s. So what does this represent? What does this tell us? This is the demand for energy. This is industrialization in the Northeast, in an area that has no native supply of coal, needing that coal, bringing that coal in. And bringing that coal in increasingly in marginal kinds of vessels. Vessels that are repurposed for the job, vessels that have been towed, vessels with immigrant families that can't swim, being the only people managing these vessels. This is the demand for coal from the central parts of the United States being moved up. If you've been standing on Park Island in 1880, you would have seen perhaps 200 coal scoops passing by the island every day. And so we have, if you like, in that area that we've been studying, an energy landscape. A landscape that is shaped by the demand for energy, that is seen in the shipwreck distribution patterns, and extended also then into the 20th century. The uh, Leland Holland over here on the, on the, on the left-hand side was one of the earliest compartmentalized uh, ships for transporting uh, oil, and the, uh, the, Cape, uh, uh, the North Cape which was an oil disaster in, the, uh, uh, in 1996. So why were we doing this work? Why were we thinking about this? We were doing this work as part of a coastal and marine spatial planning exercise called the Ocean Sand, a special area management plan. To look at these waters, think about human uses of these waters, think about the ways that human beings have been interacting with these coastal environments over time, and also think about the biology of the place, the oceanography of the place, the chemical oceanography of the place, the physical processes, the tides, the birds, and everything else. And so we were part of that discussion and that discussion was in anticipation of the development of alternative energies off the coast of Rhode Island, particularly wind farms. And so when we started to talk about the energy landscape within the concept of, the, of developing a wind farm, all of a sudden the policymakers started to listen to us because the quest for the energy was part of a historical narrative that we were able to point out and we were able to show that this was an issue that people have been dealing with for long periods of time. We developed something called the cultural and landscape approach. And the importance of this is that it looks at human interactions with environments. It's place-based, it's adaptive, it's interdisciplinary. It considers human activities on multiple levels and accepts multiple interpretations, sometimes conflicting cultural meanings of places. And that was very important because we wanted to engage with Native American groups and we got the Narragansett Indian tribe to actually write down their oral histories for the first time. Those went into the special area management plan, unvetted. No editing, no correcting, no commentary, unvetted. As uh, their own interpretation of the space. And so this cultural landscape approach that we developed enabled us to do that. And we established parallels between the way that we did our work and the coin of the realm for ecologists, which is ecosystem-based management, 
So we looked at the ecosystem-based management, looks at human interactions with the environment as one of the inputs, and we looked at the way in which human beings and the environment intersected and shaped human relationships with environments. So I'll give you one more example, and the subtitle title here that I haven't put up is, then I'll shut up. Um, in, um, in June of 2011, I was having a good day. I found a battleship. It's not often you find a battleship. <laughs> Um, over the next few days, I found more. Actually, I found another battleship, which meant we had any food for us to begin with. And then I found a battle cruiser, and then I found three destroyers and three submarines. Um, so it was, it was a good few days. The battleship was the Ostfriesland. It was German from the First World War. It had been at the Battle of Jutland, and it was very important in the evolution of naval technology. Um, the Frankfurt was a battle cruiser. Uh, again, it had been in, in Jutland. It was also important in that naval arms race leading up to the First World War and, and beyond. Oh, they've got travel rates. Just to give you some idea of what these things look like. So this is the stern. This is the, the aftermost, the back end, if you like, of the Frankfurt. You can see it. There's some little sharks swimming around and give you some idea of the scale. It's probably about 30 feet wide. The big, the big um, segment that you see down the middle is where a line a cable went out. It fairly went out. And so the, the Frankfurt sank by the bow, and so the bow was much more um, coolly uh, preserved than the stern was. And this is one part of the site. I hope you can sort of kind of see sort of what it looks like. The destroyers were also important, and I'll go through these quickly because we haven't got that much time. The G102 was, um, uh, had an active uh, service, Korea, and was one of the ships that was lost, that was deliberately scuttled and scuttled low, and then raised, uh, and subsequently some off the coast of Virginia. I'll come to uh, why in a second. The V43 was another one, then the S132, and then the submarines. The U-117 um, sunk 20 ships, had a very effective or destructive, whichever way you want to look at it, uh, cruise off the east coast of, of the United States. The U-140 was one of the few U-boats ever to actually be named. Um, so it actually had a name named after the German thing, Hero. Uh, 148 was less important. Um, this is a picture of one of the destroyers. We see lots of fishing net caught and trapped on this destroyer causing all kinds of financial damage to fishermen in the area. All of these warships were similarly uh, impacted. These are the conning towers from one of the submarines. So where were they? They were inside this red box here off the coast of uh, Virginia, right outside the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay. It's a very important area for the United States Navy. These are the southern drill grounds. This is where lots of activity, lots of testing, lots of um, drills, lots of gunnery practice took place for long periods of time in the United States Navy. This is from the New York Times Magazine in March of 1921. The bottom one, it says the plans for the greatest naval and aerial gun and bombing test ever conducted were announced on the 28th of February by Secretary Daniel, Secretary of the Navy. What took place in 1921 changed the nature of warfare. It was a series of experiments organized by General Billy Mitchell of the United States Army to test the vitality of air power at sea. And everybody at the time, many people at the time, thought that these new emerging aircraft that were much more cheaply built than the navies at the time would not be able to sink the most sophisticated machine machines that were produced by human at the time, which were battleships. And Mitchell said that's not the case, and they organized these series of experiments. Ultimately, Mitchell was successful. Here's this uh, some of the uh, exercises in action, and he is considered to be the father of the United States Air Force and his statue at the United States Air Force Academy. So why were these ships sunk there? How did the United States get these ships? The United States got the ships at the end of the First World War as a result of the armistice and the Treaty of Versailles. And so these were passed over to the United States. These German warships were passed over to the United States as a result of the treaty. And then were just analyzed. They were moved up and down the coast. A series of uh, uh, engineering studies were conducted on them. And then these bombing 
test and liberty tests. As a result of the test, warfare changed because now warfare was conducted in four dimensions, land, sea, undersea, and in the air. It turns out that this space, though, is also very, very important for other people. It's important historically, but it's also important for other scientists, particularly biologists who study these series of canyons that have cut deep into the outer continental shelf, all the way there. You just see one in there. That's Norfolk Canyon. These are like underwater equivalents of the Grand Canyon, if you like. This is some of the data that we generated, and they're important biologically because of the habitats they produce and biodiversity that they support. It turns out that the shipwrecks also support a rich biodiversity. These are cat sharks. The shipwrecks that we've just been talking about are major breeding, feeding grounds for these cat sharks. Literally thousands of them in and amongst the shipwrecks. This is the muzzle of a 5.9 inch gun from Frankfurt. You can see the, um, you can see the turret in, in the background. This is a big company sitting there uh, taking a look at this, taking a picture of it. <coughs> so, where did we come in and how did we get involved? Well, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration interested in these and the BOEM is particularly interested because the Atlantic coast is being explored as an option for alternative energy and conventional energy, oil, oil and gas drilling, and things like wind, wind farms and hydrokinetic energy. Interested in understanding these places, the biology, the chemical oceanography, they're interested in the physical oceanography, and they're also, because of the National Register of Historic Places and the Historic Preservation Act, interested in the history and the archaeology. Basically. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management manages the slightly lighter blue areas surrounding the United States. That ocean, 200 miles off its coast, is more territory than the dry part of the United States. There's a blue America that we study, there's a blue America that is central to the questions about the future of coastal zones. There's only one part of the government that brings in more money than BOEM, and that's the, map in the, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> BOEM generates something, uh, uh, something around about $6 billion in direct leases, about $120 billion of, uh, of other kinds of benefit benefits from BOEM's activity. So again, we were involved in this because we were involved in the idea of uh, of, of, develop, of, of energy and expansion. Of energy. We had a military landscape and an energy landscape that were intersecting that we studied, and as a result of that, we were part and parcel of, of, of the discussions. Very briefly, two questions that I was asked to address. Um, how do you bring graduate training and history to bear on questions? And this was longer than I narrowed it down the environmental policy and science. Um, Carefully select graduate schools and classes, is what I would say. Take classes that are related to some part of the broader, wider world, history of science, history of medicine, for example. Look for the intersection between your studies, even if it's um, a part of history that is a long time ago or a very long time ago. Look at the issues in flux and think about the way that your work intersects with those issues and those problems that we have. And then be confident. Be confident that what you have to say is important, and then, in addition to that, engage, in my case, with scientists and science. Really try to understand some of the science. Collaborate. Scientists are very, very good at collaborating. They're good at bringing in all kinds of folks to bring their perspective on the issue. I published in fisheries journals, I published in energy, engineering journals, but in order to publish in those journals, you have to make a genuine effort to really understand the subject material that you're working on. And seek funding and publish. And then the last slide, I, I was asked to think about <laughs> how seriously history was taken, the historical mm -hmm. research was taken. In my case, not very. Um, I remember when I was a graduate student, and I was sitting next to the Regis Professor of History. And he asked me what I wanted to do. And on the other side was a visitor who was a sociologist. And I started to talk. I started to talk about the intersection of history and archaeology. I talked about applying this to probably to currently issues. I talked about 
the fact that this was such a valuable part of the policy sphere, public history. And at the end of it, he said, that's very, very interesting. What are you really going to do? <laughs> so, um, and this is one of the greatest historians that I've ever met. So one of the things, one of the barriers that you have is that the institutions we have, particularly the big, powerful ones, the apex predators, <laughs> those institutions have to take part of this applied history, not all of it, not wholesale, not totally encompassing it, but part of it on board. If Columbia takes applied history seriously, that had ripple effects down in the line for many, many other institutions across the country. Institutions like this have a responsibility to do exactly what they're doing, thinking about history in action. One of the things you have in favor is there is this length of interest that other people have talked about. People are interested in history. In fact, the older people get, the more interested in history they are, which is a somewhat strange thing. Maybe it's interested in their own history. Um, so there is this length of interest, in the, and then the elephant in the room is money. Um, even if it's a few hundred dollars, try to go compete. If you're successful, you might get a few thousands, and if you're successful, you may get tens of thousands. Um, I hate asking for money, so I decided I would compete for it instead. Um, but the, uh, to date, we've brought in two and four million dollars mm -hmm. in external research grants that pay overhead to the university. We're still, still not treated with the same respect as the scientists that wanted less money and less success. We got zero in startup money, but it does provide us with a good deal of freedom. And I said that was my last slide in my mind. This was the first one I ever did. This is the entire crew. <laughs> so um, with that, I'll stop. Thank you.
got it. Um, I think I got it mainly because I stepped through the door. You know, if there were other historians there, it might have been much harder. So, um, so I think you know, going to places where you wouldn't expect a historian to be, I think actually lets you stick out. But again, I think there needs to be much more wider structural reform on the part of campuses. Disciplinary organizations have to get behind it and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's something that we really have to work towards. Um, in terms of university structure because it's very hard to work across the schools at Columbia. Um, I also think that it's, it's just so um, telling that, for example, the VP for research at Columbia only thinks of his mandate, his remit, as natural sciences. There isn't such a thing as research in the humanities and the social sciences. So, I mean, that's something that you can change, though. I mean, he's a scientist, he's very open. Um, and that's something that's changing. Uh, you had a question. Yeah, and, and this goes along with that. And I really liked your uh, presentation and, and your comment about how universities are supposed to be these economic engines. And, but at the same time that the humanities are typically marginalized, but if you look at the communities around, there, there is a lot of work going on in the humanities and that it's not all STEM. However, there's a distinction, I think, also with tenure and promotion where, for instance, there is a grant obligation that many of the scientists have to meet for tenure and promotion. That doesn't exist so much in, in history. So on one hand, we have that, and then you were also mentioning that even though you've brought in more money than I think what would be the, the grant basement for tenure and promotion at your institution for somebody in STEM, that you're still not given the recognition. I was just wondering if you could kind of comment a little bit on maybe how you use that as, as, a, as a point of a strength in perhaps bargaining, because I think frequently we don't think about those issues, about how we can, and I hate using this word, but it's used, leverage it. Um, so you just talk a little bit about that. So with my promotion and tenure, I took an extraordinary risk, which I don't have to pay for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, make sure that you get promotion and tenure. Um, so I, decided that I would build a portfolio that included grant research. I defined my job as including trying to get external research grants. In the end it worked out because I was able to target the audiences that reviewed my application. So when a scientist looked at it, they said, oh, this is fantastic. You don't fund research. And when humanists looked at it, so, um, in the end, it sailed through. Um, and, and, and I was pleasantly surprised that it did so. But it was, it was a risk. Um, and um, one of the things that promotion and tenure enabled me to do was to take more risks. Um, one of the leading arguments for it is that it allows scholars to move forward with their research, with their ideas, and it certainly did for me, um, the amount of money that we brought in after promotion and tenure was much higher than it was before, and our productivity increased dramatically. And so we were able to take more risks after promotion and tenure than we were before. Um, so that yeah, that's a really interesting point to, to define your job. I mean, that's another point that you made too. You've got to educate your administration about um, who you are and what you're doing and how it how yeah, yeah. Yes. Just a quick, um, sorry, quick follow up to that. I mean, it's important, I think, to learn the stuff that, like NSF, is not just physicists; it's also economists and mathematicians, and so on. And, and uh, the, these uh, disciplines are different. You know, in a medical school, being a professor in medical school gives you a space to raise money. That's all. If you if you're a full professor and you don't raise money, you could be dismissed. So it's a totally different culture where, where uh, and I think that. As this history is in action, you know, it's got to learn to learn those different cultures and, and learn to play by them. That that it's, it's not going to be quite the same. It's not like the historian who gets tenure and then you know hangs out. No, it's a, it's a different culture. And if you're going to be part of that, you have to really be part of that. Wait, what historians are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, I just want to ask a question, and also all of you. You know, that is the importance of timeliness in. Academic, the kind of lessons and intellectual framework.
learning we get from academic history and intersect with the public. Forget about the academy out there in the public. In the 70s here, we sent teams and worked with high schools in Harlem on apartheid. It wasn't something that the department sort of loved it, but we did it. And, and I wonder in terms of what you're talking about, you know, the problems you have to be an, act, an intellectual jack of all trades, but at this particular time, with issues of public health and science, which I have seen as a journalist broadcaster for 30 years, the public loves that stuff. The average American loves that kind of stuff. So what examples do you see about what is going on now? We're taking that and sort of giving it to the masses in really good ways to educate and enlighten the average American to think about these kind of issues, health and, 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 and science issues. Are there examples of this going on then? Well, I think our website is, is one of them. Beyond that, sir. I mean, talking to uh, websites are good, but you know, you, there's also, you got the old school. Well, there are scholars uh, in, in not, so, not so much in history departments, but uh, people in public policy schools, social work schools, public health schools who do intervention work and design the very kinds of programs that you're talking about in uh, children or whatever other target population. I see no reason why historians, I mean, the incentive structure is actually a very good uh, potential or potential barrier to this, but I see no reason why historians uh, could not be involved in, in designing some of those things, you know, even though they're not, uh, they may not explicitly in an obvious and direct way involve historical research as traditionally practiced. Um, historians, to me, generally seem to be a pretty, very sharp bunch, um, and they write clearly, and I would like to see more of them. So my answer to your question is right on. I have many questions for you, which I will ask over lunch. Um, but I just wonder one thing: Have you taken your work to the History Channel? You know, the deep water Atlantic Channel seemed like they're made for the History Channel. Yeah. Yeah. We sort of have. Yeah. There's your public outreach to the masses. Um, okay, so I want to thank all of our speakers, and especially I want to thank um, Tanya Bhattacharya and her wonderful team for uh, making this whole conference possible.